Right, it looks like we've got a good number of people in already, which is great. So I'm going to kick it off. There's just, just a bit of housekeeping at the beginning. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining our live talks event over your lunchtime to be part of the discussion on a very important subject, which is, of course, misogyny and sexual harassment within the music industry and how we can engage more people to make a positive change. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping before we start, we will be recording this session. So if you do not feel comfortable with having your camera on, please feel free to turn it off or anonymize yourself. Uh, please make sure your mic is muted throughout the session. If we have some time left at the end, we will open up the floor for questions. Please also feel free to put any questions you have into the Zoom chat and we'll do our best to answer those too. Uh, so today's session is in partnership with Safer Dance and the Association for Electronic Music, who we are delighted to have join us today. I'll hand over to Jack, Sam and Thilany shortly uh, so they can introduce themselves. But before we start, I just wanted to explain a little bit about how this session came about and why I felt the need to push for further conversation and education around misogyny and sexual harassment, particularly within the music industry. After a number of phone calls, discussions and having taken part in various panels, it became really apparent that one, there is a serious problem that needs addressing further, as you will learn from some of the statistics we'll be sharing throughout the session. And two, there is a serious lack of gender diversity and people taking the time to address this issue. Uh, working with Jack and Sam at Safer Dance has been a massive breath of fresh air. And it was, I'm excited for you all to learn from both of them and Thilany on how, as a collective, we can help reduce and hopefully one day eradicate misogyny and sexual harassment within the music industry, at the workplace, in our venues and generally in everyday life. Fingers crossed. Uh, we will be sharing a ton of resources throughout, all of which will be available as well as a recording of this session on the live website afterwards. So please feel free to share those as you wish. So it's my pleasure to pass you over to Jack, Sam and Thilany. Over to you guys. Thank you, Thank you Gabby. Thanks, Gabby. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Gabby, for the introduction and for the invitation to be involved. My name is Thilani. I'm a DJ producer and a music industry freelancer. And one of my roles is as the events and communications manager for the Association for Electronic Music. And along with two co-chairs, I lead our diversity and inclusion working group. Uh, so AFEM is a not-for-profit trade association representing all parts of the electronic music ecosystem. And we really strive to promote the best of our culture and bring people together to solve issues and ensure a vibrant, successful and sustainable future for our industry. And one of those issues that I'm particularly passionate about is solving is misogyny and sexual harassment. So thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of the conversation Wicked. Thank you very much, Delina. So a little bit about myself. I've been working within the industry for the last eight years. Along, along my journey, I've become an award-winning promoter and now sit in the sphere of a music marketing consultant who works alongside festivals, touring agencies and venues. I've always been an avid dance floor researcher. I love traveling, listening to my favorite music, experiencing new cultures. And I'm the founding director of Sort of Speaks Community Interest Company, which Safer Dance is the first program that we officially launched. Sort of Speaks is very passionate about assisting young people through recruitment and wellbeing projects. Hello, my name is Sam Henley. I am a co-founder of Safer Dance and a current risk consultant at RSM UK, which is a global accountancy firm where I've been lucky enough to take Safer Dance to the market. Um, I'm a 2020 graduate of Birmingham City University studying media and communications, where I specialised in PR and the music industries. I've always been really passionate about the growth and preservation of DIY and subcultures. I've been actively involved in music myself, maybe since, since the age of 12, and I felt safe for dance and actually ensuring people are safe, um, ensuring that the music industry is equal was, was a big part of my journey. So, um, yeah, I put Safer Dance together. Wicked. Cheers, Sam. So when talking around Safer Dance, we always think it's an important factor to tell you a little bit about the timeline and the journey that myself and Sam has been on. Um, so back into 2019, Sam joined my music organisation on work experience. During this time, this is where we was developing our sister brand, Soul Speaks, as mentioned, very passionate around developing recruitment and wellbeing projects. So 
Sam come to me and requested that some research was undertaken around sexual harassment within nightlife culture. And with us being national promoters, we thought we was very well placed to assist the development of this. In 2020, Sam successfully submitted a dissertation surrounding an early sexual harassment framework, which very proud to say he received the first class honours degree for. Now, following the dissertation submission, it was about developing and growing the idea. So we engaged some initial stakeholders. I was at a networking event and I met a gentleman called Paul Callum, um, who's an ex-detective superintendent of Derbyshire Police who headed up public protection. Paul helped us develop a more stringent framework that actually could be implemented into organisations and establishments within the nighttime industry. Um, along, the, along this journey, we engage RSVP, who are a charitable organisation, who helped us ratify exactly the terminology and what the framework stood for. Um, and we was introduced to DJ Rebecca, who heads up Me Too for the music, which helped us get in front of key venues to develop our pilot test. Now, in early 2021, RSM, uh, our RSM partnership was formed. RSM, like Sam mentioned, are a global accountancy firm um, and who have the technology that kind of keeps safe, powers safer dance in terms of their sweet insight for GRC. Um, in late 2021, the development of the pilot phase was rolled out across key venues, including Fabric London, um, whose quotation really hits home, which says, if you're serious around tackling the issue of sexual harassment, that safer dance can help. Um, I think that's a, a pat on the back for everyone involved with the development of safer dance to showcase the evidence that it does work and it can work. Now, early 2022, the completion of the pilot test, and we can officially say now safer dance has launched. So a little bit about our approach. Our two main uh, organizations that we, that we assist are universities and venues. And these really do go hand in hand, particularly with, with universities having a students union, which tends to have a venue or is in contact with venues. So they know roughly where their students are, are, part, uh, are going. However, they also might not know, they might not have full control. And our approach is really split into two. It's workshops like this, where we actually go out, we speak to we speak to the industry, we speak to students, we understand the problem and we drive actions from that. Actions to improve, actions to ensure it's safe. And we also have our mem membership scheme, which Jack is going to talk a little bit more about. Our membership, the, our membership scheme is essentially a summary of our consultancy work, however, in the form of a toolbox. We also actively be involved with our community. You know, we, we, we like to go out, we like to engage with student unions, run competitions. We were recently involved with a women's march, we claimed the night in Chester, uh, where we created a short video, which was really moving. And it, it really it really grounds us with the issue. Uh, we, we like to be involved with as many people as possible. And we encourage collaboration. As I said, we've collaborated with student unions, the likes of Live and AFEM. It widens our knowledge, widens our network, and it really brings new ideas and new perspectives to the table. And it creates safer dancers it's almost like a nice little team, like a, a community of doers that we all want the same thing. We all want a safe industry. Um, we all want it to be accessible for everyone. So cannot stress enough that uh, collaboration was really important as part of, our, part of our approach, as well as our membership and our workshops. Yeah, and I think just on that point, the collaboration aspect is we always have said from our standpoint that when dealing with sensitive issues like sexual harassment, that there's no such thing as competition. We're on the same journey to make a positive impact um, and collaboration should be at the forefront of that approach. Now, so a little bit about our membership, you know, we've always stood that when trying to create a tangible solution that can actually reach the masses, masses and affect um, the industry that, that yeah, affect the industry how we want it to, that uh, being agile in our approach is going to be an important factor. So most recently, following the pilot test, we decided to pivot our concentration away from detailed consultancy work 
and create something that is sufficient in dealing with topics around early education, awareness, access to support services, creating accessible tools like this webinar that will be available on a quarterly basis and continue to meet, network and deliver value in raising awareness. So the membership covers six points being self-assessment and feedback, industry specific training, peer networking and seminars. You receive a thousand anti-spiking lids from a safe and unsponsored positive ID, periodic material and access to support services. Now, if you want to find out a little bit more, please head to our website or just get in contact with either myself or Sam following this webinar. Thanks, on Jack. Um, so obviously we're all here to, dis to go over, raise awareness and discuss sexual harassment and misogyny within the music industry. There are some key considerations for today's workshop that we have put together. The first one is growth. Um, we've really had a very much a growth mindset, both as a business, but personally as well. We're not here to judge anyone's past. We're not here to alienate. It's essentially about waking up um, and looking yourself in the mirror. And I've got and just saying I've got work to do and putting in the, the key, putting in the key effort to learn. It's really important to know that it is a level playing field. Um, we're not doctors. We're not philosophers. We don't have a background in crime prevention. We are just two men who worked in the industry or work in the industry, and we wanted to create a safe environment for all genders, identities, and races. We're still learning ourselves. We're still growing. We're learning about this issue every day, and we want to encourage everyone to do the same. And I guess why we're here is we want to highlight our full-pronged approach, um, just to make it accessible, to make it easy to, to grasp, and that's acknowledge, commit, plan, and continuously improve. So with this personally, and both from developing Safer Dance, particularly for men, uh, there, there are challenges of allyship. There are uh, gaps of knowledge, um, gaps of information, and certain agendas that do get pushed that can really make it difficult to be an upstander. And we were very honest about that. I think particularly the one to mention is the not all men attitude. The not all men hashtag was very much is very much pushed when there is a high profile case and you know you may have some fantastic uh, men around you and you know your your group of friends might be you know really have fantastic values and it's true it is not all men but it's enough men for it to be an issue it's enough men that the statistics are so high that there's case study there's there's thousands millions of case studies that highlight that there is a gendered issue here um and it might actually be that there's negative views on modern ideals such as feminism. Men might not feel that it includes them, that includes them and that is completely far from the truth. And I think on that, there is always the perception of losing brotherhood points that, it, you know, that if you, that you do raise this concern. And I think that there's really important to mention on that, and this is just my, how I remind myself and how I remind um people around me is that there are infinite ways to be a man there's infinite ways to embrace masculinity but it's just as a whole black and white it's imperative that to be a man you're kind you're respectful and we take care of everyone around us yeah and I think you may think well you don't condone such behavior you don't get involved with such behavior but being someone that watches these problems occur and stands to do nothing I could say you're part of the growing problem instead of the solution. You know, even if it's a little bit, taking the time to edu educate yourself a little bit further, take part in webinars like you are today, take part in education training. Me and Sam, right at the start of our journey, we, alongside RSVP, took training alongside victim blaming and many others. You know, bystander training, be a part of the solution, not the problem. Now, from our personal standpoint, when we embarked on this journey, we quickly realised that the lack of education in schools, colleges and universities and even our industries was pretty much non-existent. And this kind of is a catalyst to really feeling uncomfortable about talking around the issue. You know, it became apparent to us that we had to utilise our time to educate ourselves around the issue. You know, if we were to successfully go into conduct research and develop a solution that actually helps people, um, education is a really, really important factor. We've come to the conclusion that early education is something 
that we feel could have a major impact on behaviours and attitudes throughout industry and throughout society itself. Similar stance to sex education, sexual harassment education could really catapult a reform to how young people view this issue. And I think overall, you know, if we had a longer time on the webinar today, it would have been great to go into some more detail around the challenges. Um, but I think we've highlighted some key ones there. Um, it's not it's not easy. We've been on a long journey and come across many challenges, many barriers, and I'm sure there will be many more hurdles. Um, but it's understanding that there is there is value in doing positive things and making positive changes to your attitudes, to your behaviours of becoming an ally. Now, we moving forward to the four pronged approach. Now, acknowledgement is a really important factor. Now, we understand this is a systemic problem. Three percent of females recorded that they hadn't experienced any sexual harassment within public spaces. Now that should really hit home. It really hit home with us. And UN women are actually describing this as a human right crisis. Now we understand it isn't something that just affects the music industry. It is a wider societal problem that needs a 360 holistic approach um, with key stakeholders across the board to really challenge and create a tangible change. But we do operate within the music industry. I operate within the music industry. You operate within the music industry. So we need to take a look at what's wrong within the work we are doing and what can we do to improve this. Acknowledgement is the number one factor. You know, what is something that you feel isn't quite, quite right within your organisation? Is the topic of sexual harassment being discussed? Is underreporting an issue that you see? Now, there are small changes that really can be made from the simple step of just acknowledging there is a problem. Yes, we understand it's wider than your business, but we're not asking you to change the world. Just do what's possible in your sphere of influence. Now, research and education, speaking with your audience, speaking with your customers, speaking with your colleagues, it really helps you to understand what the problem is. Um, myself and Sam right at the start of our journey we did exactly this we spoke to our customer database we spoke to club goers that was attending universities to really get a grasp on what problems they were seeing to give us a, a wider picture on okay what solutions will actually matter to those being affected by the issues it very quickly gives you a valuable insight into what solutions can be created now we've nailed down to four questions that can be asked. And um, if you want to take a picture or make some notes of these four questions, then please do. Ask that your peers, ask your colleagues, is sexual harassment risk something you consider whilst in the workplace? Can this company organization do more to combat sexual harassment? Is sexual harassment something that is talked about within this organization? And an important one, do I feel comfortable reporting sexual harassment? Look at what reporting mechanisms are in place. Are these communicated through online and offline media? So we do recommend asking these, start talking around the issue. And that was number one, acknowledge. Perfect. Thank you, Jack. Um, so once you have acknowledged, then it's imperative that there is a continuous um, commitment uh, to sell out, solidify that commitment to combat sex harassment, whether that's sex harassment management, whether it's an agenda, a framework, or just or just a group of activity, really. I think the first point would be there needs to be an agreed policy and buy-in from all staff. And if there is a policy, ensuring that it's up to date, it's accessible, and it's portraying the right message. Is it public facing? So consider consider the consider the audience, consider staff. Is is it the forefront of the business? And does it have a victim first approach? There needs to be a statement of commitment, preferably from the top, whether it's a CEO or a boss, that are committed to combating it, it, this, this issue. It's been acknowledged and there are plans in place to combat it and there is a safe environment or a route, a process to report. A little personal, personal take here is, is how can I grow? How can I, is there anything I'm unhappy with? Is there anything that I could feel I can, can improve? As I said from the start, it's all about growth, um, partic particularly for, for us blokes. It's, it is about 
um, growing your understanding and growing your knowledge of this issue and thinking, okay, how can I be better? Okay. Consider what future you want to see for your for, for the music industry. We're all here because we're, we're all very passionate about the industry. Um, what? How do I foresee that future? And summarize this within your values. Um, outline, say, three core values relating to safety um, and use that to drive targets, key performance mm -hmm. indicators. Um, in regards to a policy, in regards to sex harassment it, as itself, it's important to treat it like it's a it's it's a, it's its own standalone risk. When it's written in a policy, don't just put it within other issues. Make sure that sex harassment is its own standalone policy and it's got its own standalone controls um, and creates a control environment. Uh, for those who don't know, control is a simply just a day to day activity. That becomes second nature that basically will either minimize or neutralize the risk. Um, so yeah, that's that'll be my final point on commitment. Thanks, guys. Um, so I just want to sign point post to one thing. So in 2020, AFEM published our code of conduct against sexual harassment and gender discrimination. Um, we expect all of our member organizations to adopt this code or have their own in place. And really the purpose is to set professional standards and best practices within the industry with, with enough organizations doing the same. It's going to lead to a culture where misconduct is not tolerated and there are industry standard methods and procedures to handle it when it does occur. Um, the code is available for download on our website and it's going to be shared after this workshop as well. It's an evolving document, and while right now it focuses on gender discrimination and sexual harassment, we are actually in the process of expanding it to cover other forms of discrimination and issues prevalent within uh, music industry organisations and the music industry itself. Thank you. So the next section of the four-pronged approach is forward planning. These are the steps you can take to ensure that effective framework is in place, effective management. As mentioned with continuous improvement, change does start from within. So really focus on building the conversation internally within your business. So build it inwards or outwards. Um, ideally, there needs to be a signed commitment from all staff and key stakeholders. And I think what that really does is that creates a community of doers. Like I said, it creates like a shift within the organizational culture. It's imperative that the audience is mapped in a sense of how do you communicate with them? How do they communicate with you? Is your policy in front of them? Um, is it accessible? Are there any um, areas which could be higher risk than others? Um, is there a gap analysis? And what I mean by gap analysis is that I've mentioned aspects like reporting, I mentioned aspect, aspects like training and policy. If you don't have those in place, create an action to improve. Um, well, this could be over a three month period to develop some reporting, develop a policy. And there's so many resources out there that could help you, particularly AFEM from live. And there's so many initiatives just like us doing a really similar thing or the same thing. And that's why we actively push to develop your planning is collaboration developing new movements, developing new ideas, bringing in new perspectives. Um, cannot stress enough how it is important to be in contact um, and just push out as far as possible. Yeah, cheers, Sam. And the final point of the four-pronged is continuous improvement. Now, me and Sam, being back in 2019 when the initial idea to conduct some research I think we quickly understood that this wasn't going to be an overnight piece of work. Um, but 36 months on, we are here and we are, as mentioned before, we are still learning. We are still developing the ideation around what safer dance is and what it can potentially be. But what we've shown and what we're asking you to show is a willingness to learn, willingness to educate yourselves. Um, around these sensitive matters um, you know be a positive influence with your peers be be that force of good within your organization or even for yourself as an individual now from an organizational perspective the review 
to review the progress of sexual harassment management following your commitment and forward planning it's essential that over a, you know whether you do it quarterly whether you do it in a six month period you sit down as a team you look at the impact that that's been made and how you continually can improve on this it's like with any simple business planning you look at what you have achieved how you can move forward to continuously improve. You know, an important thing that's been mentioned a few times is creating that community of doers. Now, for us, it's about future proof in the industry that we all we all very much love. I fell in love with the industry eight years ago and I can't get away from it. I love it. Um, but it's creating that community of doers, people that want to make a positive impact. Um, and look at the resources available. Feline is gonna go through the resources that are available. Um, and for the next couple of slides, but do some research, have a look what's out there, take the time to educate yourselves. And the most important thing is stay involved. We'll pass on to Feline now to discuss some resources. Well, oh, thank you so much, Jack. Um, so I've just compiled a few resources, um, and this is mostly organisations that we've worked with, but there are so many more out there. And if you have some really great ones, can you please throw them in the chat? Uh, we're going to distribute these and more after the workshop, so no need to like write things down. Um, but yes, yeah, so of course the Safer Dance guys are doing great work. Uh, we highly encourage that you get in touch with them after this. Um, as Sam previously mentioned, sexual harassment and violence is seriously underreported and actually studies show that around 60% of workplace misconduct goes unreported and workplace sexual harassment accounts for about $2.6 billion in lost productivity annually, whereas an open and inclusive workplace culture sees staff retention increased by over 40%. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can influence this culture. Uh, there's tech solutions like in chorus that uh can mitigate a lot of the reasons why people don't report misconduct there's organizations like safer dance ntes and for consent that offer training programs or work with organizers venues um companies to create safer spaces for their staff but also for their uh, customers and next slide please <laughs> Cool. Um, for individuals, uh, oh, we're missing something here. Uh, the AFM, if you have been a victim uh, or survivor, sorry, of harassment, you can contact our sponsored helpline, which is administered by Health Assured. They offer support. They offer resources. Um, yes, uh, I think we're missing something here. That's all right. Uh, for for consent, also help uh, have a survivor hotline. Musicians Union uh, have a number of safe space schemes and uh, Me Too Music is a really great resource that uh, we're going to, I think we have some other slides there with a lot of regional specific uh, uh, helplines which are going to be available to you. Um, oh, I think these are a bit out of order. That's all right. Um, if you can go back to the one for individuals. Okay, we're missing a slide. That's all right. Um, I would like to also just spend a minute talking about the Jaguar Foundation Safety and Inclusion Rider, um, which I will include after this. It's a small, it's for artists and it's a small piece of text that you can copy or adapt and add to your own contracts and riders. And it asks promoters and venues to commit to making all lineups inclusive with a diverse range of artists performing and that the promoter agrees to implement a zero tolerance policy with regards to prejudice and harassment of any kind, including sexual harassment and violence. And like our code of conduct, the more contracts that include these riders, the more promoters and venues will have to listen and adapt and commit to making these topics a priority and having safeguarding measures in place. If you're an artist, I think it's super important, especially if you're a male artist, to have this in your rider, to have this in your contract. Think about whether the lineups that you're booked for are really representative of your scene and if the promoters have measures in place to ensure the safety of everyone that's involved, not just yourself. Um, but yeah, just get involved. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to say join AFEM. We work on a lot of initiatives across the industry, um, across health and sustainability and emerging technology. And personally, I would love to expand our DNI group and the work we do with more hands and minds. 
uh, educate yourself. We're going to be sharing a load of resources, um, including research pieces and other articles. There are so many campaigns you can get involved with, is either as an ambassador or just with your support and voice, educational events like this or the Nightlife Safety Summit. But even just in your own communities, organizations, friendship groups, like keep the conversation going. Listen to people who have experiences in this area and be a safe and supportive space for them. And I think Jack or Sam has one more way that you can stay involved. Yes. So one of the final points you want to raise is that Safer Dance wants to create a advocacy group for men. Um, so a, a, gr a solid group of men that are passionate about change, driving the message, shifting the culture, um, where we sort of discuss maybe like three months, three months at a time, two months at a time, discuss how we can drive a campaign, uh, have creative solutions to combat this issue, get more people on board. So if you're if you're a man watching this and you're really interested in joining our advocacy group, you know, we're going to discuss, talk, um, share ideas every couple of months or so, we've got a sign up sh sheet, which I'll put in the chat. So if you're a man, you want to sign up, um, that's, that's, that'll be brilliant. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you. I'll put it in the chat now for everyone. So if you do, thank you. Great, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, so yeah, Sam's just posted that link to the sign up. If you are uh, male, non-binary, trans, everyone is included of course sign up to the group um and then the uh, sam and jack will be in touch from safer dance to move that group forwards keep on talking um yes yeah, so we've got some time that actually went quicker than expected um mm -hmm. but I, i'm aware everyone is on probably on their lunch breaks but we've got some time for a few questions uh so i'd like to open the floor to everyone here so please raise your hand if you do have a question or if you'd just like to say something uh to anyone in this group uh you are more than welcome i've got something to say quick um people often talk about like ways well i don't hear enough about um preventative measures of, uh, on dance floors so i run a, a music venue and obviously we we often get told about how to react to people who have suffered from or been a victim to sexual harassment but um it's better to prevent it in the first place but that's something that i find we're not educated enough in really so if you had any recommendations or anything to help with that that would be great sam jack do you have any response to well, that? i think in terms of the dance sources this is where i think the early education is going to be really imperative with moving forward and growing uh, within our industry. You know, it's, it's a very difficult and sensitive subject. And, you know, to actually create preventative measures for dance floors, that means we're going to be policing our dance floors, which is contradictive for what really music stands for. Um, so it's there's no real recommendation at this stage, but I do think early education within schools, colleges, universities is definitely something that needs to happen. And it is it's bubbling through, you know, causes with the London mayor. There is things occurring um, that are being put into place to develop these early education programs, um, you know, to shift that attitudes and behaviours really from the offset. Um, but yeah, no, sorry, I couldn't be of more help. Is it Maxine? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it really me. is um, shifting culture and shifting attitudes. <clears throat> early on and as I said we do have the the growth mindset um you know no 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 of it was just maybe just looking at like me even looking back at your past and oh, you know that was that wasn't right um I think I think it's important yeah it is very much a shifting culture within circles within within society it, that's I think is the best preventive measure really yeah. it's just about yeah. positive influence positive role models both male female non-binary um and just positive shifts on attitudes really um i think and a few people are also mentioning this in the chat and i think this is one of the things that uh comes up when you do work with one of these organizations that we've signposted to is having staff there already keeping an eye out um having signage around your venues um i know here in berlin 
some venues here have got specific sort of care staff that are walking around that are keeping an eye on things so they can see uh, if something is amiss before it actually happens. So if someone is feeling uncomfortable, they can, there's someone to talk to already before an incident actually occurs. A strong communication strategy, I think, is always a good preventative measure as well. You know, you're online, making sure that you are pushing, that you you have a zero tolerance towards these attitudes and behaviours. Um, I don't see enough venues do that online. I think when there's big, the, the big cases occur, then everyone kind of jumps on the bandwagon for a little bit, but it's not consistent enough. Um, so, yeah, that's another thing I would say on that. Yeah. Yeah, we do... Often, like we, every promoter who books venue, we send them a, a rules of the dance thing, which is something we try and do, which basically says zero tolerance for discrimination, harassment of any kind. Um, try and get them to share that. We still get certain certain promoters draw a certain crowd, which you just you know they've not read that or they just don't care, which is the problem, isn't it? That's why you're saying it's like a culture change which is probably bigger than just the nightlife industry yeah 100 of course uh thank you so much uh maxim uh mercer i know you asked a question earlier on needle spiking do you want to go next sorry if i didn't yeah. pronounce your name properly <laughs> yeah can. uh yeah nice to meet you um yeah i was just curious about the needle spiking if you have like uh information education on that too because um also well, additionally to the needle spiking, which is like a, at least in Berlin growing problem, um, there are a lot of um, spiking incidents actually happening ba through bartenders and through friends. So if you have a cap that will only prevent it from, um, well, you know, other people, but it doesn't like prevent it being put into your drink by your bartender or your friend. Um, so it's kind of like, I don't really feel that giving out those things or say what's your drink is like getting us anywhere. Um, that's the one thing then kind of felt also like you weren't really talking about intersectionality and how that kind of is really important to see, especially with sexual violence, because there's a lot more harassment um, in place for uh, women of color, for uh, gender minorities of color, for trans people, for people with disabilities, etc. So um, I think if you only look at one piece of it, that's a little too, that's not enough for me at least. Um, and also in your um, the way you were talking about later on, you were talking about non-binary, but you were talking about women the most of the time. That's just like a reminder in general, maybe to get also some diverse perspective into your own team um, to have that more in, in mind. Um, as to the question about like um, how to prevent stuff, I think it's really important to get like your whole team and your guests into the process of making your code of conduct and then um, kind of like very very openly tr communicate that all like through posters through flyers to actually speaking to people at the door to having them on the website on the social media it's like flooding it at the, mo at, the at the start to actually make clear that you're taking it seriously and to be really clear for example how to find your um the person that's responsible if you need to file a complaint or want to have support um if you have like a extra staff on site if you don't have it then everyone else needs to be trained extra carefully um in generally the Staff needs to be trained. Um, all those things need to be in place. Else, it's just like a pretense washing, like you're doing it, but you're not really doing it. So I think that's really important. Whatever you want to do, do it right and only promise stuff that you can keep up with. Because a lot of the times that we've um, worked with people, they actually didn't think about the follow up and actually handling incidents afterwards. And then they went back to how it does it reflect on my space and that it makes me look like a bad space. Um, yeah, I think. Those were my main things. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you for the feedback. Uh, inclusivity is something that we are striving for. Again, still learning. Um, I am a woman of colour myself, so I, I kind of thought that that would be included. But uh, yes, uh, this is something that we uh, we are we are still learning about. So thank you for your feedback. With the drink spiking, um, this is not super my area, but in one of the resources that I shared, NTES, one of their training programs is specifically around uh, spiking and needle spiking. So I'm going to share that resource after this as well. If the guys want to. Nice one. Thank Yeah, thank you for the feedback. We've Yeah, I've made some notes. We'll take it on board. Great. Right. Yeah, I'll second that, yeah. Uh, okay, Louisa, do you want to go now? 
Yeah, hi. Uh, it's nice to see everybody and thank you guys for doing this and thank you everybody for showing up. Um, and I guess the question would be about kind of like, I wonder what we could do as a community or, you know, as members of the electronic music industry to create an industry standard protocol for what happens after there has been an incident, because I do think that like prevention is super important, but like it seems then everything falls apart and there can be a lot of kind of cancel culture stuff happening and, and it creates a, a culture potentially of, of shame and like kind of going back underground with shitty behavior. And I wonder what it would look like to have conversations that could kind of lead to a more actionable uh, form of mediation or, or yeah, uh, a culture of consent. And then what happens if that isn't happening? So I'll take my answer on mute. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that, um, Louisa. I think in terms of as a, you know, moving forward, the one thing that when we speak with venues is that the one thing they do say is that they don't want to become the police in the matter. You know, they want to be supportive. They want to put measures in place where they can direct people to support services and get the professional help. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do quite like the idea of a, a code of conduct for intervention not prevention um, obviously the aim always is to prevent and not intervene and um, maybe it's a conversation that we could pick up after to potentially develop um, it's not something that we have discussed before so um, but yeah the conversations from the venue standpoint is very much you know that they're not not so much not interested but they're I think there's a little bit of worry there about becoming the policing factor in uh, these issues and that's where the you know governmental bodies and support groups are there great thanks guys um i just want to note there's so many amazing um links and resources being shared in the chat we will take all of those um offline and, and share those on our resources list on the live website afterwards along with this uh recorded workshop so I'm just I'll, I will grab all of those before it ends um but thank you so much everyone for sharing it it seems that everyone has a lot of amazing ideas uh and sharing a, a ton of issues that we we all need to start working on more regularly and obviously a, a load of organizations who are already really pushing forwards on this matter um I'm just kind of scrolling for any more questions does anyone else want to put their hand up um, he might have asked a question in the chat. Um, I've seen the, Sam. Have you? I think this, the form needs to be made public so people can actually. It's that's it's, done. It's, it's uh, had some oh, signups already. Yeah, that's all sorted. Apologies about that, guys. Thanks to everyone who's interested in signing up to that. I think that's going to be a really great step forwards in involving more um, more men in the conversation as well. Um, I think. That's it. And uh, yeah, I just kind of scrolling. I think that's all the questions. If I've missed anything, please do shout now. Um, otherwise, I will probably wrap this up. Um, I think there's just one question I wouldn't mind getting there. It says, uh, here we go. What about artist behavior, off the cuff comments, jokes, lyrics, issues not predictable beforehand when booking, including within lineups, either sanctions people have used or suggestions? Um, I think it's, as a prom someone who has been a promoter as well, um, obviously you can't predict these things, but there needs to be consequences after the fact or during the fact. And I think this is where things like the safety and inclusion rider come in. If the promoter commits to having safety uh, policies and safeguarding, if one of the artists is misbehaving or behaving inappropriately, then they have committed to taking action. You know, these artists can't be booked again. There needs to be consequences. And this is going to then flow through into the culture where people know that they can't play at a festival and be creepy or inappropriate. Um, yeah, just consequences for behaviour. But this is where things like the policies and writers come in to creating this um, culture within the organisations. Definitely. And I think there's there's been a recent occurrence of an artist making some homosexual comments and pretty much all promoters stood together about making a positive change within uh, the drum and bass sector and he hasn't been booked again since and I can't see him being booked and um, so it's good to see that these you know one people are doing things that they shouldn't be doing there is consequences actually being done by the community 
I think you meant to say homophobic. <laughs> I'm just sorry. Uh, there's also a question in the chat. Do any from Liam O'Reilly? Do any UK operators have any recommendations for training providers specifically for door staff? Is that something that you guys do at Safer Dance? Or I mean, we've got a few venue owners in I know in the room today. If, if you have any recommendations for training providers on door so staff. Yeah, so there's we we met someone when we was at the um the charter summit in London. Um so I can connect someone if they if they want to drop me an email, I can I can make that connection happen. Um I can't recall the name for the life of me, um, but it is somewhere. <laughs> Michael Kill from the Nighttime Industry Association, um, or the Nighttime Industry Association do have an arm which is related to door staff and security. Um who, who we have regularly spoken to as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's also a really good contact. Perfect. Yeah, Nick has just said, shared something in the chat, UK Door Security Association. The um, yeah, there's the NTIA and also the NTES that provide these kinds of things. Perfect. And all of this will be shared afterwards. Perfect. Uh, okay, great. Just one more scroll. I think we might have covered everything. Last chance for anyone to say anything, ask a question. Louisa. Yeah. Okay, fab. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. And thank you, Jack, Sam, and Thilany for all your time and efforts in putting today's session together. I'm sure everyone can agree there's a lot to think about and so many uh, resources that we can delve into following this session. Uh, I really hope everyone can take something away from this and if everyone can do at least one thing to progress positive change, whether that's the information sharing, joining an advocacy group, or sending a resource to a friend, then we're one step closer to doing uh, to a better environment for everyone. Uh, we really do need more men to take this as seriously as women, otherwise we will forever be preaching to the converted. So thank you everyone so much for joining today. And I hope to see you all at one of our future live talk events in 2023. And if you do want to get in touch, free, feel free to email me. Uh, I'll just post my email in the chat now. Uh, but thank you so much. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys.